Okay, here's what I want to do next. I posted an article on, on Moodle. It's written by a couple of very prominent environmental economists, Ian Perry and William Pizer. These two men wrote a nice summary. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty short kind of six or seven page summary of the issue of carbon taxes versus cap and trade. This is a little bit more of a, um, a practical real world analysis of what we did on, on Monday, which before we did on Monday, which was a, uh, remember we did an analysis of prices, prices versus quantities. That was the kind of the theoretical analysis that Martin Weitzman had done in 1974. Uh, prices in this case corresponds to the carbon taxes and the quantities corresponds to a, a cap and trade policy. And we, we, we talked about at a theoretical level, how, how those two policies are different. They, they perform differently under uncertainty, depending on how steep the, the marginal damage curve is. If it's the marginal damage curve is steep, a cap and trade policy is going to perform better on average. If the marginal damage curve is flat, the, the tax policy is going to perform better on average. And then Perry and Pizer kind of fill in that analysis a little bit more, uh, put some flesh on it, and talk a little bit more about some of the practical concerns and the practical issues with, with a carbon tax versus a cap and trade. So one of the, one of the fundamental issues with, with a carbon tax relative to a cap and trade is that the carbon tax fixes the price of carbon at a constant level. So from a firm's perspective, you know exactly how much it's costing you to pollute, which is helpful, especially if, especially if there's a lot of intense uh, investments that are required for, for abating pollution. So like, just like in our, our simple stylized example of in-class problem seven, where we had source B, if you remember, we had source B that had like a $3 upfront investment it had to pay, and then it was able to, uh, to abate for only $1 per year after that. So it kind of spent some money upfront, and then it was able to abate after that at a constant uh, low, low rate, low cost. If you, if you think about from the perspective of the firm, you're willing to do that. You're willing to sink this $3 up front if you know for a fact that there's going to be some payoffs down the line. If you're uncertain about what the payoffs are going to be, maybe they could be high, maybe they could be low or negative, you might actually be deterred from putting a big investment into it because you don't know what the payoffs are. So one of the, one of the big things about cap and trade that's, that's tricky for uh, you know setting setting policy, if we think about the per like a permit price, you set the you set the quantity of of, of permits at at say Q bar. You set the aggregate amount of permits. The, the amount of allowable permission is set at Q bar, and then that will dictate that will dictate what the price is based on economic conditions, based on the you know the the availability of energy, the cost of energy, the cost of alternative. Uh, sources of energy, which are, are changing all the time with market market conditions and, and conditions in the in the Middle East in terms of how available oil is. So you you end up all that price uncertainty from you know just just fossil fuel markets, energy markets, all that uncertainty gets transferred into the uh, a, a permit price. So the permit price, you know, the permit price is going to be you know it's going to be low, it's going to be high, it's going to be fluctuating around. And from a firm's perspective, if you are thinking about reducing your pollution, let's think about it this way. If, if, you, know, if you know for certain that, that permit prices are going to be high in the future, you want to do everything you can to try to abate your pollution because either you have to, if permit prices are high, either you have to spend a lot of money acquiring extra permits to keep polluting, or alternatively, if permit, if permit prices are high and you abate pollution, then you have an asset that's very valuable that you can sell to another firm. So high, high permit prices are going to mean that it's, it's profitable for you to invest in abatement technology. But let's say, you know, if, if, you, you know, if, if you're sitting here maybe at time T and, you know, permit prices look pretty high at that point, you, you decide to maybe, up, you know, invest a bunch of money. You, you, if you're firm B, maybe you decide to invest that $3 in pollution control. Well, you know, over the next couple of years, you know that this price might might just completely tank, and now now you've invested money in abatement in order to have an asset in order to have an asset that's worth a lot of money, but that asset is now worth very little. So if you're holding permits, you know if you invest in this abatement technology, maybe you're holding a lot of excess permits. You're expecting to be able to sell those in the market, but the price just plummeted, and so now you have now you have a a, a bunch of permits that you have you have a bunch of uh, an asset that's now basically worthless, and you've you've invested all this money 
um, and not gotten that much back in return. And so the firm is always going to be having that in the back of its mind that even if it's profitable right now at the current permit price to invest in pollution control, the fact that that the, the price could be going up and down and eventually going way down, that's going to inter- deter investment in, uh, in pollution control. That's going to make it very it's going to make the firm very hesitant to put money into into pollution control. So that that's what this that's what this first point is talking about. Where if there's a carbon tax, firms have a, a nice stable signal, a nice predictable signal about how much it costs them to pollute. Whereas with with uh, a, a permanent policy where where the quantity is set and then price is unknown, in that case. They have they have um, a, a very uncertain investment climate. They don't know exactly what's going to happen, and they might be deterred. They might be deterred from investing in pollution control technology because they don't know what's going to happen to prices specifically. Okay, so that's one that's one practical concern for choosing a permit policy versus a, a carbon tax policy. Another consideration, which is brought up brought up in this uh, this Pizer and Perry article, is that there's different revenue implications for a, a tax versus a, a cap and trade system. So a, a carbon tax is definitely going to raise revenue. That's going to help the, the government budget. It, it also might allow you to lower other kinds of distortionary taxes in the economy, like income taxes, which are taxing work. So income taxes are, are inherently a little bit distortionary because ultimately we'd like, we would like people to work. When people work, they are producing things, they're contributing to society in, in productive ways. And if we tax it, we're kind of giving them a little bit less incentive to work. We're not letting them keep as much of their money as they would otherwise, and so it, it kind of it's going to put a damper on on the amount of, of output on, on the amount of productivity in the economy, and being able to raise revenue with the carbon tax in theory could allow you to reduce other kinds of taxes like reducing the income tax, which disincentivize something that we actually would would like people to do. We would prefer that people had incentives to work and to serve each other and to to go out and and insert themselves into society and and produce valuable things for society. So a carbon tax could potentially raise revenue, which would be able to allow the government to potentially offset other kinds of distortionary taxes like income taxes, which which disincentivize things that we would we would like to have. Alternatively, the revenue, even if it's not used towards uh, reducing distortionary taxes, in theory, it could be used towards investments in basic re- research and development, basic science, basic study of how to make batteries, how to make fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cells, or other kinds of power storage technologies, energy energy harnessing technologies. In theory, that's another thing that the extra revenue could go towards. So that's that's those are some of the advantages of, of a carbon tax. Stable prices, which makes a, a nice predictable investment climate for firms, as well as revenue raising capacity for the government. Let's think of this some of the from the perspective of again a carbon tax. Some of the disadvantages of that is that this is not an economic argument, but it's a practical argument, and it's just the fact that that there's there's typically a lot of political resistance to new taxes. It's just difficult to get anything going in, in terms of proposing something like a carbon tax, which is going to uh, ha- have a lot have a big effect on both large corporations who use energy and produce energy, as well as middle class and, and lower class families who are going to have to pay more in, in energy costs as a result of a carbon tax. So it's it's just not, it's not very politically palatable. Not that it wouldn't be overall a beneficial thing to do. You know, there's ways to, to raise raise a carbon tax or, or introduce a carbon tax that's, that's potentially high, but then reimburse low and middle income families um, in order to, to offset some of that some of that high fiscal burden on those families. So th- there's ways to do it, and it still could be a, a, an effective thing to do from an economic point of view or from a social point of view. It's just that, practically speaking, there's historically been a lot of resistance to any time a, a, a carbon tax is, is introduced in, uh, in the legislature. So that's, that's a practical thing. Uh, there's also a possibility that instead of revenue going towards you know reducing income taxes or going towards investments in research and development or investments towards subsidies for low-income families. Once, once the government raises revenue, there's, there's really no telling uh, where it's going to go. It's not as if the government is, is a benevolent organization that's out for the good of the public necessarily. There's, there's lots of lobbying. There's lots of special interests, which have a lot of sway in terms of how money gets spent. And a lot of it, a lot of it could go towards just pet projects in certain Congress people's home districts different kinds of pork, pork barrel projects. That's a potential disadvantage is even if you're raising revenue, you don't know where it's going to go. And it's, it's, 
it's uh, you should never underestimate the uh, the capacity for the government to uh, to waste money. So it's not it's not a guaranteed um, slam dunk. All right, so that's that's a potential disadvantage. One way that you could look at this, if you wanted to make sure that that some kind of pollution limits were put in place or some kind of pollution control was put in place, is one thing you might do is you might give away permits to firms and polluters based on their historical levels of pollution. This is called grandfathering. It's it's taking how how much firms have polluted in the past, using that as a baseline for how how many permits you want to give them, and then maybe you maybe you, you scale it back a little bit. Maybe you cut that back from the baseline by, by say, 10% in order to reduce the cap and reduce the, and put a, a tighter cap on emissions. Maybe you have some plan to tighten the cap a little bit each year over some number of years. But in any case, you're, you're giving the permits away initially, and you're basing those, those permit levels and permit quantities that you allocate, you're basing them off of historical emissions levels. And that's potentially more, more politically palatable to firms they're much less likely to put up a fight if they can have their their permits grandfathered rather than um, having to pay a, a tax for every unit of pollution that they that they do. So that that could be something that makes makes it more politically palatable and and it gives you at least an opportunity to get some some carbon control without the same level of political resistance. Now there and this is this is talked about a lot in in the Perry and Pizer piece. But there's ways to design a cap and trade system which actually can mimic some of the characteristics of of the carbon tax. So we talked about before how how one of the disadvantages of a of a, a permit system or a cap and trade system is the the uncertainty in price. One thing you could do to mitigate that is to have some kind of price guarantee. The the article refers to this kind of thing as as a safety valve or a trigger price. The government could, in this case, guarantee to have some, you know, some permit price that's guaranteed in the event that the price gets too high or too low. So we talked about how, um, you know, if if the if the permit price gets too low, all of a sudden it it's not profitable for for firms to invest in pollution control anymore. So so firms might benefit from from knowing that they can get at least some baseline price for a permit. If they make, if they want to plan on making some long-term investment, you know, you also might just find out that that pollution control is 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 extremely costly. It's more costly than you thought, and it's it's exorbitant, ex- exorbitantly expensive for firms to clean it up. And so you might have, you know, some ceiling on on the price, where if the price gets above a certain level, the government guarantees to um, uh, to buy and sell permits at at some some capped price. Maybe it's maybe there's a, both a lower and an upper bound, and so that that at least that can serve to um, you know mitigate some of the price uncertainty. And even if there's still fluctuations in price, government guarantees on the on on an upper bound and lower bound on the price can at least give firms a signal that the price is going to stay within some some band, which could be a helpful um, a helpful thing to know. And so that could, you could design a permanent system where there's some there's still some there's still some uh, sub characteristics that you like from the carbon tax scenario. Which you can integrate into a, a permit system if you have some kind of um, trigger price or some kind of safety valve. So that's one way that that you can you can design you can even design a, a cap and trade system to sort of imitate a uh, a carbon tax. Another way to 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 maybe make design a cap and trade system so that it imitates a carbon tax is to auction off permits rather than rather than just give them away. So if if revenue if raising revenue is one of the things that you'd like to do. Then you could you could also auction off the, the the permits and make firms pay for any permits that they want to to hold and keep. So this could be this could be a, a way to um, again you could raise revenue, offset other kinds of distortionary taxes with a cap and trade system. So there's there's it's not as if you only get one set of characteristics with a carbon tax and you only get one set of characteristics with a cap and trade system. There's kinds of intermediate sorts of designs where you can have cap and trade systems with with trigger prices or safety valves or cap and trade systems where you auction off the permits rather than giving them away, which will will tend to, to imitate a carbon tax system a little bit more. So these different design choices are interesting in, in real world policy. And I'd encourage you to go and read that that Perry and Pizer article to um, to hear it directly directly from them. But I've I've highlighted some of what I see as the the main points from that from that piece. So this this next topic is part of um, sort of a subset of, of this agriculture material. And this is the economics 
the economics of soil erosion. This is not the, uh, the geology or the chemistry or the agronomy of soil. Uh, this is the economics, which means we're talking about, we're talking about incentives and we're talking about payoffs. We're thinking about what do these human beings want to do under, under the, the choices that they have given to them. We're thinking about what do people stand to gain? What do they stand to lose from choosing various options? And what do those, what do those choices imply for other people? So this is, this is the economics of, of soil erosion. Uh, and this is, this is how we want to look at everything in this class. We want to look at you know, the, the kinds of topics that you've, you guys have been looking at in your, your writing assignments. We're looking at these issues from the point of view of, of incentives and payoffs. And that's, those, those incentives and payoffs are going to be key to diagnosing the problem and, and pinpointing exactly, exactly where the problem is coming about. And it's important to understand that so that we know what, what kinds of solutions are, are more likely to work than others. So this is the framework of the class. This is the framework of, of economics. This is kind of how we're looking at all the issues in this class. And soil is no exception. So this is, I'm going to present here uh, with the, the time remaining today, I'm going to present here an economic model of soil erosion. And this is not something that I've, I've uh, specifically come up with out of my own brain. I read a great paper a few years ago by Kenneth McConnell, which was published in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics. Um, and he has an economic analysis of, of soil erosion where he presents a, a simple model of, of soil erosion and, and discusses the incentives and the payoffs and the implications for whether, whether or not we would expect uh, soil to be mismanaged and under what circumstances would we, would we expect soil to be mismanaged. Uh, it's possible for soil to be mismanaged, uh, but it depends on the incentives, it depends on the information, and it depends on the context. Uh, of the actors involved. And so let's, this, this is going to be, I'm going to set up this model uh, because it's going to be key for understanding why soil might be managed well, as well as why soil could potentially be managed poorly. So this is going to give us a hint as to when we could, when we would expect one of those things to occur, mismanagement versus uh, the other, which would be good management or good stewardship. All right. An economic model of soil erosion. We have a farmer who, who has some ways of producing some food crops or fiber crops. Maybe it's cotton, but it, it could apply equally well to, to fiber crops. So let's just say it's food crops. The, the kinds of choices that he, that he has are this physical capital. How, how intensely do I employ tractors and machines and, and uh, large farm implements? Those things are going to have... Um, you know, large investment costs and they're going to be durable goods that are going to last over a long period of time. And how intensely you use those is going to affect your productivity. And it's also going to affect the quality of the soil and the, uh, the potential for soil to, to uh, blow away or, or exit your farmland in some way based on how you're tilling it up and, and kind of spewing it and, and, and dislodging it from, from where it's sitting in, on the land. So the physical capital matters. Uh, variable inputs are going to matter. This is, you know, this is these are going to be things like fertilizer, pesticides, irrigation water that you're applying, high yielding seeds that you're using. I'm going to use I'm going to use this very these variable inputs as kind of a um, you know it's it's a little bit of of a proxy for in in uh, intensity for intensity of of soil use. So. You know, I, I'm kind of assuming that, you know, the more fertilizer that you're using, the more pesticides, the more irrigation water that you're using on your land, that's kind of, in a sense, that's a, a proxy for using your land more, more and more intensely. We would expect with more intense land use that we would have more, more soil erosion. So this, these variable inputs like fertilizer, you know, fertilizer isn't, maybe it doesn't technically increase erosion, but, but it's sort of a sign that you are farming more intensely. And there's, there's sort of, erosion that could that could occur increased erosion that could occur with more with more use of those variable inputs when you when you are using those more more intensely um, the, the last choice that's under the control of the farmer is how much erosion control does the farmer want to actually employ directly and so this is thing these are things like rotating your crops having not just a single crop every single year but but switching it up and having some some more more intensely farmed crops some years and then some more lightly farmed crops in other years 
to let the land rest a little bit. You might also yeah, you just completely decide to, um, to fallow some of your land, maybe let your land rest and recuperate after a certain number of years. You might employ no-till or minimum till practices, which, which will be less likely to, to, to disturb the soil and, and, and dislodge the soil and, and have it sort of either blow away or, or wash away with water. You could employ some grass buffers. You could set aside some of your land to, to put some vegetation to kind of hold the soil in place and, and maybe act as like a, a barrier to soil kind of washing away or washing off your land especially if your land is kind of hilly. Those look like this. Uh, kind of picture like this is, is, is an example of kind of a grass buffer where you have the brown is the, is the crops and then the green is the grass buffer where you, you, you set aside some land. You're not able to farm on that land, but that, but that grass buffer ends up helping you to kind of keep your soil intact, keep it from, if it does, if it does become dislodged and kind of wash, wash off of, of one part of the, of the land, it might be uh, captured by by uh, by this grass buffer and not and not end up washing off completely and, and going going off site in it and going into a water source or somewhere else. So that's 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 an, those are examples of erosion control strategies. So those are the three things that I'm assuming are under the control of the farmer, and those are going to have some payoffs as well as some as as some costs. And all three of these things are going to affect. Are going to affect soil depth. So as you use as you use more intense machinery, as you use as you use machinery more intensely, as you use tractors more more intensely, as you use as you work the land more intensely and farm and try to get more yield out of it by using more fertilizer and more irrigation water, for example, that intense use uh, is going to degrade the soil depth. It's going to reduce your future soil depth. It's going to dislodge more soil. And cause more soil to be um, uh, transferred offsite and kind of degrade the quality of, of your of your soil and and diminish the the depth of it. And so you're going to be trading off you're going to be trading off measures that that enhance your 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 soil depth against measures that that diminish your soil depth but that increase your your annual profits. So in this simple model, I'm going to say that we have three basic relationships. The first is between annual profits and these uh, measures that are under the control of the farmer. Annual profits are going to be a function of, so this, this F means that these are a function of the capital that you use, the variable inputs that you use, the fertilizer and, and other uh, intensity of farming that you use. It's gonna be a function of the erosion control and a function of the, the soil depth. And specifically, it's gonna be, annual profits are gonna be positively related to things like the level of capital that you employ, so profits, you know, we would expect profits to profits to go up as as K goes up. You know, same thing with fertilizer. We'd also expect profits to go down as erosion control erosion control goes up because erosion control practices are are costly for the farmer. So if you're, for example, if you're setting some of your land aside to make a, a grass buffer strip, that's land that you're not able to use for cultivation. And you make you make less uh, you make less money on that, and so you you have to, you have a um, a negative relationship between erosion control and annual profits. So that's the sense in which it's costly for the farmer to implement erosion control practices. The profits go down as erosion control goes up. Profits are also going to be positively related to soil depth. So so this comes into play. This this we have these these incentives to to do more capital. Uh, more intense capital investment, more intense application of fertilizer and and variable inputs, more intense farming. Those increase our profits. We want to do less erosion control because it costs us, you know, resources today. We have to lose our we have to lose out on some profits now because we do more erosion control. But these kinds of things are going to eventually affect our soil depth, and so our profits are actually indirectly affected by. Uh, by those other measures, by capital, fertilizer, and erosion control, our profits are indirectly affected through our relationships of those choices on our soil depth. And so let me explain, that's this next relationship we have. This next relationship we have that soil depth is a function. So this is just some function G. It just means there's some, there's some relationship between soil depth and these characteristics. Soil depth is related to, to, to capital, uh, to fertilizer, 
to erosion control. But in this case, soil depth is negatively related to, to, to capital intensity or fertilizer intensity, and it's positively related to erosion control. So as, as in this case, as, ero as capital goes, goes up, soil depth goes down, which if you remember from, from our previous relationship, if soil depth goes down, that's going to negatively affect profits because soil depth is, is positively correlated with profits. If soil depth goes down, our annual profits eventually are also going to go down. Okay. Uh, similarly, erosion control in this case is, is if that goes up, soil depth goes up. And so that's going to be something that could eventually increase our future profits. And so that's, that's, the, that's how this relationship gets a little bit tricky, where there's some incentives to, to kind of abuse the soil, but there's also other countervailing incentives to, to preserve the soil. And the last relationship here that I want to show is that land value, we would also expect to be re related to soil depth in a positive manner, where, where the more that you degrade the soil, the less your land is going to be worth. And the more that you, the more that you preserve the soil, the more your land eventually is going to be worth. All right, so there's going to be a simple, this simple model of soil erosion is going to involve some farmer, I'm going to call him Farmer Brown, who is going to farm for some number of years and then going to sell his land in the future. He's going to retire at some time T and cash out. He's going to sell his land in the future. And eventually, uh, he's going to, he knows he's going to do that. And so the question is, how does he manage his soil between now and at time t when he retires and so we would expect sort of the the incentives or the 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 economic underpinnings of this of this model are that this farmer farmer brown is going to want to choose his his level of inputs and erosion control to maximize you know the present value of his stream of profits from farming as well as the present value of of the land's resale price so he because he wants to eventually retire cash out, sell his land, and make some money um, and have a nice retirement, he doesn't want to degrade his land too much because degrading his land, decreasing the soil depth, decreases the land value and decreases the amount that he gets at time T. So the farmer is going to care about both of these, both of these things and not just, not just his, his current profits. And so this is going to be, this, these, this incentive structure is, is fundamental to understanding how we would expect either soil to be um, either to be managed well or managed perhaps uh, poorly or mismanaged. So that's that's the setup. That's the setup of this model. Um, I'll talk about next class some of the ways the way, the factors that might matter for whether or not we could expect the the farmer's soil to um, to be degraded excessively or perhaps to be um, used in kind of a, an optimal way in a way that that sort of maximizes benefits to the farmer and to society as a whole. So that'll be coming up in, in next class.